Coming up next on Art Rocks, the Alexandria artist whose art is equal parts camera and computer. I started doing photography in 2010 because my husband bought a brand new camera. He's a photographer. I said, just show me a couple of things in Adobe Photoshop, and he did, and that, that was it. Plus, Magnolia Mound Plantation, an antebellum landmark right in the heart of Baton Rouge. That's all coming at you right now on Art Rocks. Like the impulse that drives an artist's creativity, Georgia Pacific's 850 Louisiana employees are driven to produce quality paper products for your home and business. Georgia Pacific is proud to support LPB and Art Rocks. And by Lamar Advertising Company, proud to support the arts and Art Rocks. Headquartered in Baton Rouge, Lamar's 461 Louisiana employees have been helping brands and businesses reach their customers creatively for over 100 years. Art Rocks is made possible by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and by viewers like you. Hello and thank you for joining us for Art Rocks. Temper your expectations because I'm James Fox Smith, publisher of Country Roads magazine. First, let's meet the Alexandria artist who keeps her creative energy planted in several genres. Leslie Elliott Smith makes surrealist dreamscapes created from photographs she takes herself. So while the photos themselves might be real, the landscapes she makes out of them are literally out of this world. I started out at LSU um, trying to get a fine arts painting degree and realized when I was a sophomore that I really probably needed something that was going to get me a job, so I went into art education. I had a degree in fine arts printmaking, so I did lithography and etching, engraving, and that's what I got my master's in. I've done over 200 paintings. I've, I've done about 50 prints, and in photography I have 96 photographs I've done since 2010. When I did my paintings, I would start out usually very much like I would start a print, which in lithography you do layers on layers on layers of color in order to build up and get this nice depth in the work. I was painting with acrylic because I'm allergic to oil paint. I usually put a matte medium or a gloss medium with it to thin it out to make it more transparent. You can buy more transparent acrylic paint but I tend to buy opaque acrylic paint and would rather thin it myself because then I can control it the way I want it to do. And I might paint a surface on there, press something into it to get a texture, or take a rag and scrub it off, or take a pencil and scratch through it. I want to get that depth in the piece. In this particular piece, I wanted time to be an element of it, something that was sort of about decay. So I used grave markers for that. And they're kind of falling over, and she's trudging through the water, and the tree is barren. This piece was, for me, to speak about the unbelievable pressure I was under at the time <laughs> to just do everything in the world that I had to do, and I didn't have enough time to do it in. And this one has found objects. It has actually a, a grapevine branch in it, and the frame was made from found wood that somebody was throwing out. I build all my frames, and sometimes I'll build structures for the piece to go into. I started doing photography in 2010 because my husband bought a brand new camera. He's a photographer, and he gave me his old one, which was a very good camera. <laughs> and we went out and we did some photography, and I came back and I said, just show me a couple of things in Adobe Photoshop, and he did, and that, that was it. I generally finish 12 photographic pieces a year, and what I do is whatever I photographed, I use it as elements, like I would do in a painting, only I'm painting with photographs. It's called a composite image um, in photography. In this particular photograph, there might be 15 layers of images laid on top of each other, and I can take those in Adobe Photoshop and make them transparent and paint 
literally paint on top of them in Photoshop with the colors that they have and the brushes they have. And I don't do as much painting as I do layering. It's the same process, it's just with photographs that I've taken as opposed to images I've drawn and painted. The particular ground on that one is actually from Inglewood Plantation. The sky is some mums in the backyard. <laughs> and the birds they're flying are from the zoo in Houston when there were thousands of pigeons and we just watched them fly around the little lake that's outside the zoo. When I'm starting with a photograph, a lot of times whatever is happening in politics or the news of the day affects me personally and especially with Hurricane Harvey, which I had friends in Houston. Um, one friend whose house went under in that 50 inches of horrible rain. And I had friends in Florida for Irma. And then of course we have Maria. Immediately, I knew I wanted to do a work about the hurricanes. So I had a building that was from Lake Charles and it's the courthouse building. And it's just a very historic, classical looking, it's got Corinthian columns on it. And so then I said, I want some people kind of struggling in water. So I, I looked in my photographs and found some water that I wanted to put in there. And then I, I wanted some clouds in there for a storm. And I had two friends' daughters come and they modeled for us. So I have three of those in there. And so as I'm working on this piece, I already knew what I wanted this piece to talk about. I wanted it to talk about the, the human struggle and what was going on with those storms and how it was devastating. And I actually use a mouse to cut out my stuff. You manually cut them out. So it's like drawing, only you're reversing the process and removing information. All of my work, it doesn't matter whether you're going all the way back to when I was in school, tends to be narrative in some form or fashion. I'm putting the imagery out there for you to look at, and I want you to bring your own history to that imagery and decide what this story is. I'll give it a title, and the title is always integral to the piece. I only have maybe five pieces that are untitled. I have two printers in my studio. I can go to a 17-inch print. That's as big as I can print personally. As a printmaker, you are held to the standard of making sure that you did not print more than what you said your edition was going to be. You made sure each one of those images looked exactly the same. You made sure they were archival, and you didn't use somebody else's images. And I've never used somebody else's photographs. And I would never use somebody else's photographs in my work because it's my work. I want to make you feel something. I want your emotions to be a part of the image. Whether it's just looking at it and going, oh, I relate to that. Or what is she trying to say? And you try and decide what that is that she's trying to say. Leslie has enjoyed a long and storied career as both art teacher and educator on both the high school and the college levels, and she draws on all those experiences to animate her latest creations. No matter where you live in Louisiana, opportunities to connect with the arts are everywhere. The trick is knowing where to look. So here's a list of just a few of the festivals, concerts, destinations, exhibits, and interpretive events coming up around the state. To learn more about these and other events in Louisiana, keep your eyes peeled for a copy of Country Roads magazine. And while we're at it, LPB's Art Rocks website features an archive of previous episodes, so to see any episode again, just log on to lpb.org. Up north now to Dayton, Ohio to meet Willis Bing Davis. He's well known for his distinctive mixed media work that pays tribute to his African-American heritage and culture.
Davis has been a teacher, a mentor, a curator and a gallery owner. He uses the arts to spark dialogue and build bridges in his community. I characterize the work I do as reflecting what I experience and see and, and what I feel about uh, being alive. I always thought that my work was a reflection of my whole experience of being. Almost saying that this is what I saw, this is what I felt, and this is how I expressed it. It's all, all my way of acknowledging that I was here. I learned early on that no matter what material, what process, or what technique I use, it's still coming from the same feeling and the same uh, reservoir of experience. My work is all speaking about the same thing, no matter what the material. At the core of it is the being a part of the human family and knowing that that also attaches me to every human being and that I am a product of everybody I've experienced and seen, that they've been a part of me. I'm happiest when I'm making art. I feel the most complete and the most human. I cannot remember a time that I did not make art. I made a, a public commitment that I was going to be an artist in the fifth grade when the teacher had me stand up uh, beside said, oh, everybody in the class, say what you're going to be when you grow up. And while I had been identified already by that time as being the next athletic star in my community, I knew it, it was art. I grew up in a small enclave of African Americans in East Dayton. I saw people who, who did art, who did dance, who did music, both at the church, community center, on, on the playground. My older siblings, drew and painted and sung. My mother made quilts. So I had a nurturing environment even though it was externally considered impoverished. It was only after I grew up that they told me that we were poor. But it was very rich to me that it was okay to be an artist. I had four years of art in high school and the athletic director, Mr. Beekman at Wolfright High School in East Staten was my art teacher. I chose to go to DePaul University in Greencastle, Indiana. And I took art there and then came back and began my career in 59 and 60 to teach art in high school and go on to master's work at Miami and Indiana State and the School of Dayton and Institute. I had a tremendous amount of knowledge about art in terms of the masters. So whether you're talking about French Impressions or Surrealism or Picasso, I had all that knowledge in my head, but no one had given me knowledge about me. And so I began to look around my hometown of Dayton, Ohio, and begin to look at Native American art, Inuit art, Maya, Inca, Australian Aboriginal, and traditional African art. And what I found is that art wasn't just about paintings you hang on the wall, that it was about spiritual, cultural, and social values of people, and had always been there, and that the arts were interrelated, art, music, dance, drama, to reflect feeling. And that changed me. In 66, I said I stopped teaching art, I began to teach people. This is the 12th year for Visual Voices, and that's one of the highlights of our exhibition season here at Ebenezer Gallery. The Visual Voices show is at the Schuster Colson Performing Arts Center in downtown Dayton. So I wanted to do something with some of the African American arts in the community. I serve as a curator and this year, I selected the theme Black Life as subject matter. You can celebrate any part of the Black experience, but I want to look at some of the things that are happening that we may be able to address in a personal way to contribute to the dialogue. Because we know the problems that we're confronting as a society aren't going to go away anytime soon. We may not have all the answers, but we can raise some questions that's worth discussing and considering. Much of the problems that we're having today are man-made with limited information and narrow biases. The arts touch us and unify us in a way that adds to our humanness because all societies, all cultures have always used music, dance, drama, creative writing through ceremonies and rituals to reflect what was of value and what was of beauty in their society. And so art then becomes a, a natural ally to human unification, if we let it, if we let it. It's the original instrument 
Human voices raised in song. Well, here's to those sounds, courtesy of the Heartland Men's Chorus based in Kansas City, Missouri. Heartland Chorus members have been gathering to sing together for over 30 years, and now they're taking the show on the road. So let's hear this. And say to those who blame us for the way we chose to fight, that sometimes there are battles which are more than black or white. It's been said that nobody's afraid of a choir. So we can get up there and we can tell our truth, we can sing our truth, and people are able to receive and hear it. And it changes hearts and minds. Choral organization, especially a volunteer organization, can't succeed unless they put out a good product. If you get on stage and you don't sing pretty, uh, people don't, you know, unless it's your mother, uh, they don't want to come and listen to you. We've got the whole gamut. We've had people who are first time singers, but we also have people who are seasoned musicians. I think amateur singers are more willing in, in many cases to go, sure, I'll try it your way. <laughs> now in his second year at the helm, Dustin Cates, like his predecessors Reuben Reynolds and Joe Nadeau, learned the choral craft with E. Feely at UMKC. So he's always looking to build the perfect blend from the 150 or so voices he has at hand. This most recent show, with its emphasis on a cappella tunes, put everyone to the test. Singing and maintaining your intonation is a, a challenge for any singer, uh, but particularly those who are less experienced singers. And then you add more and more of those participating in the choir, and then it, it becomes even more of a challenge. And so I think they did an outstanding job. They sang that a cappella music really well. Now add a little beatboxing, some radio head, a few costume changes, and voila, these aren't your grandfather's choral concerts. I certainly subscribe to that formula made popular by Joe Netto and then also Tim Selig from the San Francisco Gay Men's Chorus, where you want people to laugh, if you want people to cry, you want to give them a chill bump. And I think that's part of the reason why Heartland Men's Chorus concerts are so popular. We did a concert called And Justice For All that was probably one of the most powerful experiences of my life uh, because it, it really brought home uh, the fight for human rights. Keith Weidenkeller was an audience member long before he signed on as one of the few straight guys in the group. As he's well aware, for many of the men who surround him here, there's a lot more to this than just a chance to sing. For many, many chorus members, uh, the chorus is a safe place, a place where they can be themselves. It's a very welcoming place and a very supportive place. And that's really important, especially if you don't have any place else where you feel that. Let me put it this way. I came out two years ago, okay? Um, and one of the things that helped me to come out was the fact that I knew I had a community to go into. A choir director himself, Michael DeVoe, was married with children when he attended that concert two years ago. Seeing so many gay men standing proudly on stage, he says, helped spur his life-changing decision. I've gone through some difficult things, and these men come around me and give me understanding, and they break all of my stereotypes. It's amazing all the people that I know around me. I mean, they are amazing. I can't tell you how grateful I am, how excited I am about this group. There's a, a good work table over there. The thing that I didn't know until I was on the inside was the community of support that the chorus is to its singers internally. 
And then the work that they seek to do externally in our community uh, through social justice and singing, you know, at various community events throughout the course of the year. That is the chorus's best kept secret. And I think that's a story as we look to the next 30 years that we, we need to be telling more. We're back in the Bayou State now for this week's Louisiana Treasure. Despite being an old homestead that dates from the 1700s, it's only a stone's throw away from bustling downtown Baton Rouge. John Sykes tells us about Magnolia Mound Plantation. Magnolia Mound Plantation is a former sugar plantation located between LSU and downtown that's been a Breck property since 1966. It was originally a 1785 Spanish land grant to an Irishman and then was later owned by a French family, uh, the Duplantiers. And then during the Civil War, it was owned by a man named George Hall. Um, it was an active sugar plantation until 1903. That was the last crop that was harvested here at Magnolia Mound. We're on 16 acres. We try to tell the story of early Louisiana colonial history to our most important audience, which is area school children. We see 3,000 school children a year who come and do living history programs with us, hands-on activities. to kind of get a feel for what it was like to be in the early 19th century in Louisiana. We try to tell a story that includes both the rich and the poor, the black and the white, and what life was like. History often is made to seem like it was a wonderful separate time, but it also had its own trials and tribulations, and we need to understand it in a, a realistic manner. We have seven historic structures. Uh, the original main house built in 1791. Uh, we have an early slave cabin from 1830 that was brought from Point Capi and rescued. Um, it is associated with the family of Ernest Gaines. So we're very pleased to have that here in Baton Rouge, which means a lot to that uh, local author. Uh, we have this building, which we're at, at the Overseer's House, which was built in 1871. And we have three other historic structures on the property. Buildings are like three-dimensional history books, and so bringing out here school children to see what life was like and being a part of it, and the, even the smells of our buildings and what they're like, kind of gets a sense of what um, is, they can't get on the page. Um, and at doing activities brings it uh, history alive and more present to them. And I think it means uh, as a long lasting experience. We've been here um, open to the public for 50 years. And so we've seen uh, generations and generations of Baton Rouge area school children come through. And Magnolia Mount is always a part of that experience of learning history. Each year we welcome about 15,000 visitors to Magnolia Mound because we represent kind of an early period in Louisiana colonial history, 1790, so we're an early place to visit. And we attract about a quarter of our visitors from France and uh, French-speaking Canada. Uh, they're very interested in the French Creole life and the family that lived here were French Creoles. And so that brings that interest. And our, besides Louisiana residents, the, the next largest state that represents our visitors are Texas residents that come through as well. So we are, um, uh, have been a frequent place to, uh, between travels from New Orleans to Lafayette, uh, French visitors and others visit us as well. Let's close with a trek up to New York's Upper West Side. That's where you'll find the Cathedral Church of St. John the Divine and the breathtaking Gothic architecture and exquisite stained glass windows that have kept the faithful coming back for generations. A few years ago, the cathedral temporarily added to its already stunning visual beauty with a suspended installation by the Chinese artist Zhu Bing. This monumental work took a veritable army to create and install. Have a look. The cathedral's a work of art itself, but it can create an extraordinary venue where the visual art that's put under the roof of the cathedral can be not only amplified, but also in some ways uh, rediscovered by people so that they can educate their imagination, critiquing the world as it is, but also reimagining the world as it could be. You look at these phoenixes and you may not at first realize these birds are sculptures created out of junk, debris, and they become beautiful. They tell a story about people who were throwaways, discards, people who were used and not cared for, and our eyes are potentially opened. 
2008, Shubing, after about 19 years living in America and specifically living in New York and in Williamsburg, returned to China. Soon after he arrived back, he was invited to make a piece for a new building going up in the Central Business District. What he saw at the site, because the building was just being constructed, alarmed him and disturbed him. And he decided to accept the commission and his first inspiration being the workers and the condition of workers. I like to think of it as being about his reaction to China today. So it's a piece made out of the remnants of the past about the future. Finally, a Taiwanese collector comes, Barry Lam, who says, I will finance this. The interesting thing about the Phoenix is that it changes wherever it is. When it was in Beijing against the skyline of that city, which is so big, the Phoenix looked quite small. And when it was at Mass Mocha, it looked like a lumbering creature, and it was low to the ground. It looked very animate, and it looked very worn. But in the cathedral, its spiritual aspect comes out. I think he saw extraordinary dimensionality, and he liked the size of the cathedral. He liked its height. He liked the soaring arches. The Phoenixes came this January on what was maybe the coldest week in decades, snowstorm. They came down on 11 trucks. They came in pieces. The two great birds were lined up in the nave of the cathedral in the order in which they were going to be hung. The whole process took more than 10 days. It weighs, combined, 12 tons. It measures together 200 feet. You've got saws, and you've got drills, and you've got shovels, and you've got ribbons. And the most amazing thing that you have is big chunks of concrete, because these birds look so light. He covers the whole bird with the LED lights. So we've got this bird made of tools and heavy working materials. But by putting these filigreed lights all over them, they look like they're flying. In Western mythology, the phoenix is a symbol of resurrection and renewal. In Chinese mythology, it's second only to the dragon as a powerful symbol. And it's a symbol of unity and a symbol of grace. So whichever myth you choose, the cathedral seemed like the perfect place. And that's going to do it for this edition of Art Rocks. But remember, you can always watch episodes of our show online at lpb.org slash artrocks. And if you can't get enough culture, Country Roads magazine is a great resource for making the most of Louisiana's vibrant cultural events and attractions all around town and all across the state. So until next week, I'm James Fox Smith, and thanks for watching.